Welcome. I'm Justin King. I'm the Policy Director for the Asset Building Program here at New America. And I really want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. It is great to have you here, uh, whether you are uh, in the audience physically in the room or uh, virtually watching us online um, or stuck in Buffalo, New York under seven feet of snow. Uh, you, I think most of you know our work in the Asset Building Program is focused on broadening access to economic resources. Uh, primarily through increased savings uh, and asset ownership. And, and the key insight of this work uh, is that you, you cannot determine somebody's economic status uh, or their well-being by looking at them at a moment in time. Uh, th those things unfold over time. And the power of assets and savings uh, is that unlike a lot of other supports that are available, they give people the ability to manage the ebbs and flows of life much more effectively. They can help a family managed an emergency, but they also change the way that families think about the future, uh, and they give people the power to realize their aspirations and dreams. Uh, and that's an incredibly important and, and, and powerful, uh, powerful tool. Uh, assets and the lack of assets is a huge part of the story of inequality in America, and it's a huge part of the story of economic mobility and immobility in America. Um, that means policymakers really ought to be thinking more about families that are struggling with lower incomes and fewer resources. Uh, it means we need to focus on those vulnerable families and think about ways uh, that we can not just alleviate their immediate needs, but also provide them pathways uh, to a more secure uh, future. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we don't really do this. Uh, our policymakers have put in place rules, and I want to emphasize that it's, it's the rules and not the programs themselves, by their nature, that help to keep people poor. Scholars call these kinds of rules poverty traps. Uh, poverty traps have gotten a lot of attention uh, in the last year or two. And the next few years may really bring us an opportunity to have a full debate about how the government helps people uh, and, and how those rules in those programs uh, may uh, cause people to be stuck where they are. And if indeed we do have that debate, I really hope that policymakers will take the time to read the book uh, that's the focus of our event today, Trapped in America's Safety Net. Professor Andrea Campbell from MIT has written this book based upon her family's experience uh, with an extraordinary tragedy. And I want to begin by thanking her sister-in-law uh, and her brother for their courage and fortitude in facing uh, their circumstances and for allowing their story to be told. And I also want to thank Professor Campbell for, for her courage and generosity in sharing this story with us. You'll hear the deta details from her. Um, but I, I do want to highlight for you that this book, to me, is as, as clear and concise an explainer of uh, American public policy as I've read in some time. I, I think back to being a young Hill staffer, and I wish someone had handed me this book. It would have accelerated my learning curve um, tremendously. Uh, and, and it doesn't just explain the programs, it explains the impact of those programs on real people and the terrible and often impossible choices that are forced upon people who are struggling with very difficult circumstances. The conversation here in Washington about aiding families in need tends to be very siloed, it tends to be very negative, and it tends to be very abstract. Um, the Social Security Disability Trust Fund is going bankrupt. Uh, Able-bodied workers are cheating their way onto the disability rolls. Lottery winners are stealing food stamps. Uh, and this book takes on some of the reasons that, that those are the headlines that dominate the conversation. But it, it does a good job of reminding us that behind all that hyperbole and behind those headlines, obscured are the stories of real people. And if we could keep those people in mind and listen to their experiences, uh, we'd all be better off and we'd have a better conversation that might lead us to a better place. Um, as I said before, uh, Professor Campbell uh, is a professor of public policy at MIT. I'm so excited she's agreed to join us today. Thank you very much. After she shares this story with us, she'll be joined by NPR's Pam Fessler. Uh, Pam works at the National Desk for NPR and is their lead poverty reporter. And we're very thrilled to have her moderating our conversation today. Um, after they have a, a dialogue, we're going to invite some other policy experts up to join us on the stage. Uh, and have a full conversation uh, with everyone on the room uh, and, and uh, those watching remotely 
uh, can contribute questions and comments to the debate using the hashtag uh, trapped in the net. Uh, Michael Morris is here. He's the director of the National Disability Institute. Michael's been a leader promoting greater economic opportunity for people with disabilities for over 30 years. And my colleague, Rachel Black, is here as well. She's a senior policy analyst in the Asset Building Program, and she's been a leader in studying the interaction of program rules, uh, particularly related to asset limits and prohibitions on savings uh, in public assistance programs. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, and if I could, I'd like to invite Professor Campbell to uh, kick us off. First of all, I want to say thank you to Justin for the very lovely introduction uh, and also to New America for sponsoring this event and putting this program together. Um, I, really, I really appreciate it and to all of you for being here and all the online folks as well. Um, I, I want to use my family's story to talk a little bit about how social assistance and means-tested programs are structured in the United States and the ways in which those designs um, really pros, uh, pose incredible barriers to those people who are receiving these programs, barriers that uh, prevent them from making, making more out of their lives um, than, they would, than they would want. Two years ago, my sister-in-law, Marcella, was the victim of a hit-and-run car accident. She was on her way to nursing school, a new profession, profession that she hoped to enter to bring uh, her and my brother into middle-class financial security. Instead, uh, because of the accident, they were plunged into the world of means-tested social insurance or social assistance programs. The accident left her a quadriplegic, so she uses a, a wheelchair. She's paralyzed from the chest down. She has some use of her arms, very little use of her hands. Um, I should also add she was pregnant at the time of the accident. And fortunately, my little nephew, their son, survived. Uh, and he seems to be fine, as she says uh, she was his human airbag. Um, but the accident did mean a, a complete change in the lives of Dave, my brother, uh, and, and Marcella. She is now enrolled in Medicaid, which is the uh, social assistance program, the health insurance program for low-income Americans. Uh, it is virtually the only source, public or private, for the kinds of long-term supports and services she now needs. She needs personal care assistance, a home health care attendant to help her with bathing and dressing. Um, she has to be catheterized every four hours. Medicaid is the only source of this, especially for a person her age, she's now in her mid-30s, who's going to need decades worth of care. This is not, these are not services that are covered by regular health insurance. It's not covered by Medicare. It's really only Medicaid. Now, uh, as uh, I should say that my new book, Trapped in America's Safety Net, chronicles their story. Uh, there's lots of themes in the book about how these programs are structured and the many limitations they impose. But I want to focus on just one today, and those are the asset tests and what the asset limits mean to the people who live under these programs. As a disabled person now, Marcella is categorically eligible for Medicaid, but she also has to meet the income and asset limits for her state, which is California. They live in the far northern end of California. So she and my brother have scaled back their income to 133% of the poverty level in order to come under the the income cap, but they've also had to shed their assets to come under the asset limit. Uh, beyond their home and one vehicle, they can only own $3,150 in assets total. Any kind of financial asset, bank account, retirement account, any other vehicle they might own, the value of all those have to come under $3,150 in their state. Uh, it varies by state. They're told, you're lucky. Without the baby, the asset limit would be only $3,000. The other thing about this asset limit, it hasn't been changed since 1989, and it's lost half its value in that period. So what does it mean to be under this asset limit? Well, they can't have an emergency fund or not much of one. Uh, they can't save for retirement. A retirement count of any kind, like an IRA or a 401k, counts towards this asset limit. Uh, they can't save for college uh, for their son using the tax-favored 529 plans. Uh, those would count against the asset limit. After the accident, they had to spend down uh, their, their modest assets to come under the cap. They had to liquidate their bank account. My um, sister-in-law had a small 401k 
uh, plan balance from, a, from an earlier job. She had to liquidate that and pay the early withdrawal penalty. Uh, my brother's hobby was to work on old cars. Bad hobby to have if your wife is now on Medicaid because those cars count toward the asset limit. So he had to sell all of his cars. The one that he kept is a 1968 Datsun pickup uh, because it's only worth $200, right? And it's going to count against that cap. Um, they had to keep the receipts for all these items, show how the money was used. The money could only go into the house and to their one exempt vehicle, which was a used wheelchair van they bought for her. They couldn't use any of their liquidated assets to pay credit card bills. They couldn't pay off her student loans. It could only, the money could only go into the house and the vehicle. So going forward, they face a great deal of uncertainty and, and financial instability. I mean, just taking, taking my brother getting to work. You know, the only able-bodied adult in the household now has to drive this 45-year-old vehicle to work. It has no modern safety features. It weighs less than a Miata. I mean, it's a little tiny old pickup. When I was in high school, I learned how to drive on a 1968 Tatsum pickup. It was an old vehicle then, and I was in high school 30 years ago. Um, and uh, more recently, he actually swapped the pickup out for another old car, a 1968 Volkswagen Squareback, because uh, its value, too, is only $200. But he, he needed a back seat to be able to transport the baby. Um, the problem is, you know, sometimes he had to rebuild the engine. Uh, he literally was making some of the engine parts himself. Uh, he works at a metal fabrication plant to just, so to save money, because of course they have to have low income. He was literally making the metal parts himself at work to rebuild the engine. Sometimes you know it, it doesn't, the car doesn't work, or he's you know in the middle of fixing it. He has to beg friends for rides to work, or try to to try to borrow their cars because there's virtually no public transportation in this rural area. Everything that happens is an emergency. The ramp mechanism for their van stopped working. The repair cost $3,000. That's the sum of their asset limit. Now, as it happened, their tax refund came in at the same time and went right back out to pay for the van repair. But if that ha hadn't happened, you know, what are they supposed to do? Um, and then, they, and they can't save for the retirement for the for, for the future. So take my brother. When he eventually retires, his only source of income will be Social Security. He can't have his own additional savings. Uh, and in fact, his Social Security benefits will now be lower because he's had to low his, lower his pay to come under the state's income limit. Um, you know, they've got very little in savings. And just imagine what that's like. If you had no, virtually no assets, what happens if your water heater breaks or you need a new roof, any of these kinds of things? Like, how do you manage with no assets? Um, so that is sort of the thumbnail sketch of their situation. So what would I like to see happen? Um, I would love to see these asset caps eliminated. Uh, most people, most Americans, actually have very modest assets. Uh, and certainly people in, say, the bottom third of the income spectrum have you know, just a few hundred dollars on average. Um, chasing down the tiny amounts of assets most of the folks in these programs have is highly inefficient. It's very costly administratively. Uh, lifting these asset caps would give such families, you know, a measure of financial stability. It would improve their ability to, uh, you know, improve their lot without, you know, rather than cutting them off at the knees. It's, of course, you know, ironically a core American value, you know, to protect your own folks, to work hard, or to you know, protect your own family, take care of one's own, uh, improve your situation in work, uh, in, in life, work hard. All of those values are undercut by the way these programs are structured. And in fact, lifting asset caps is the way that policy is moving in many regards. Half the states don't have an asset limit for Medicaid. David Marcello just happened to live in one of the states that still does. Um, and under the ACA, those people who are newly eligible for Medicaid don't face asset caps. Now, this creates some uh, irrational disjunctures. So for example, in California, if you were, say, a single male who, uh, adult male who newly is eligible for Medicaid, you would not have an asset cap. Whereas Marcella, because she's in one of the original eligibility categories, still has the asset cap. Um, so there are some uh, illogical wrinkles in, in policy that lifting asset caps would, would get rid of. So you know these caps, they're, they're perverse, they're inefficient, and um, uh, 
I have a long wish of policy changes I would love to see vis-a-vis -vis social assistance programs, but I would start with, with uh, lifting these asset caps. So let me stop there. And <clears throat> that was great. Thank you. Great summary. Uh, for anybody who has not read this book, it's really amazing. It's incredible because it so clearly shows by, ta by, by taking a personal story, something that you know I as a poverty reporter have seen, heard about repeatedly, mm. but this so clarifies and it makes it so real. Um, after I was reading, I was read like the second chapter, I said, I can't believe there's more, you know, <laughs> because it's just so astounding. And I think you uh, describe it as falling down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the other interesting things about it, you talk about how um, a lot of these programs, the way they're developed, these means-tested programs, the way they developed over time, mm -hmm. It, it actually was intentional that we have a system where we were trying to create um, aid programs that actually made it not so desirable to be on aid that you would in fact want to take um, a low-paying job rather than be on assistance because there were so many negatives uh, to um, collecting assistance. Mm -hmm. So wh wh what have you found about why the programs were developed this way? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the age-old fear has been that if programs are too generous, uh, that people will want to enter a program rather than working. And so these parameters were set to, to discourage people from doing that, to make uh, being in these programs worse than the worst job out there. Um, and what's happened, this is something that dates back to the English poor laws. I mean, that was, that was the origin of that sort of orientation towards programs for the poor. And it certainly you know, continued uh, to this day in the United States. Um, and I should say that as jobs have deteriorated in many ways with you know, the, the minimum wage losing real value over time, with many employers dropping benefits like health insurance and so on. As, as the quality of jobs has fallen, we've let these means-tested programs fall in quality as well by not doing things like uh, you know, adjusting the asset limits or the, or the income limits for inflation. Uh, so as jobs have gotten worse, these programs have gotten worse uh, in conjunction. But, but you, know, you also said that um, there seems to be a shift now, a little bit away from that. What, what is sort of propelling that shift? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, another motivation uh, among, see, no, no state wants to be a, quote, welfare magnet, right, uh, to, to provide, because all these uh, means-tested programs are jointly run by the state and federal governments, and state governments generally set benefit levels and eligibility. And uh, states might fear that if their programs are more generous than others, that people will flock to their state, for example, uh, or that if they make the parameters more generous, that the roles will go up. Um, but what's happened is that um, over time, states have realized that administratively it can be very expensive to try to administer some of these aspects of the, of the programs. Uh, for example, I was talking to a Rhode Island official, one of the states that dropped the asset cap for Medicaid, who said, you know, just, it costs us so much just to chase these people down. It's, it's cheaper just to insure them. Uh, or Virginia got rid of the uh, asset test for TANF the Transitional Assistance for Needy Families, the Cash Welfare Program. Uh, and the same thing was true, that when they dropped the asset limit, uh, enrollment went up a tiny, tiny bit, but the administrative savings were far greater. And so it's turned out to be more efficient uh, not to have these asset caps, and has not resulted in you know, huge numbers of people suddenly flocking to these programs. It's interesting. Sometimes I have uh, come across people who say that they have to go report every month, mm. sometimes to reapply for uh, and, and to sort of reprove that they are still eligible right. when they should be looking for a job or they should be working a job. Sometimes, sometimes they have not been able to hold down a job because they have to keep going and reporting to the welfare office or the social service agency. That's right. It's, it's actually very complicated being in these programs, uh, precisely because of these um, re, you know, reapplication processes. I mean, in the case of David and Marcella, they're in several different programs. And some programs she has to reapply every year. Some, play, some programs she has to reapply as often as every three months. Um, and for someone like her, it's not as if her condition is changing. Um, but she has to still provide my, my brother's paycheck stubs and so on to show that they're, they're, they're keeping their income and their assets under these caps. Um, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit about one of the other things that I found kind of incredible in this book, and that was that um, 
you had initially thought, or, or your uh, brother and sister-in-law had initially thought that she was in one particular um, version of the Medi-Cal program, and it was mm -hmm. only in fact-checking this book that you, in fact, found out a, a really very important mistake that had been made. And to, to me, it illustrated just how complicated these programs are when even you know somebody who clearly is as knowledgeable as you you know, that there was a mistake made, and, and it was a pretty fundamental one. Maybe you can explain right. that one. Um, these programs are extraordinarily complex, and I think that's been one of the most humbling aspects of this whole experience for me, is thinking that I would be such a help to Dave and Marcella, and then finding out that I don't know the on-the-ground details by any means. Um, so what Pam was referring to is that um, there are many ways to be eligible, and many sub-programs within Medi-Cal California's Medicaid program, uh, as many as 100. And um, originally when the, when the accident happened, a social worker told them that because my brother worked, they were in a version of Medi-Cal called share of cost Medi-Cal. And the way share of cost would work is that if my brother, at the time he was earning $3,200 a month, they were allowed to retain $2,100 a month in income. And any month in which she had medical expenses, which of course is every month, they had to pay their share of cost, which was the gap between $2,100 a month and whatever my brother made. So that was, uh, it's, it's sort of like having a, a health insurance program with a giant deductible that resets every month. So every month they had to pay the first $1,100 of her Medicaid services. If my brother were to make more money, get a new job, their share of cost would simply go up. Um, so this is obviously a very draconian um, uh, program. So that was like 100% tax on any additional money he would earn. Exactly. So that's another, you know, sort of uh, perverse way in which some of these programs are, are designed. I mean, who in America confronts 100% tax? Poor people <laughs> in share of cost Medi-Cal. Um, so it turned out that uh, when, I, when I was finishing up the book, uh, the press uh, University of Chicago Press got me access to these very high-level officials uh, in Sacramento to help me fact-check the book. And we're going through the details, and it turns out that she didn't necessarily need to, need to be in share of cost Medi-Cal. There could be another program that, they could, that she could be in, retain eligibility, but my brother would be able to make somewhat more money. Um, we didn't know that without this kind of access. Um, and what's really extraordinary is <laughs> not only did, is there no way for me to know this, right, until I get this kind of access, the Medi-Cal official said, well, there's probably thousands of people who are in the wrong version of Medi-Cal, and you know, what can you do? Um, the other extraordinary thing was the real question we want an answer to is, what is the maximum amount of money that my brother could make without rendering her ineligible for Medi-Cal? So I put that question to this state level official and he said, I can't tell you. Um, I, you know, he did, literally didn't know the answer. He said, you should really just, um, the World Institute on Disability, uh, which is based in, in Berkeley, California, it provides a lot of resources for disabled people, go look on their online calculators. Um, so I just found that extraordinary that, you know, even the people running the program couldn't provide us with the answers. And you're really talking, I mean, this is a dis difference between maybe total destitution and maybe mm -hmm. being a little bit better off. I mean, these are very crucial differences. Oh, absolutely, you know, because they could retain a little bit more income and provide much more stability. Um, the, other, the other thing that we found out uh, by talking to these state level officials is also very concerning. Um, probably the best situation they could be in would be to enter a program called California Working Disabled. California and a number of states have uh, pioneered programs to allow people on Medicaid to work, especially disabled people, without losing their health insurance and their personal care assistance. Um, CWD is one of these programs. It, it's very attractive because not only does it allow you to work and retain eligibility, but also any income that the disabled person earns can be put in a separate savings account and doesn't count against that asset cap. And the disabled person can even open an IRA and save for retirement without that counting against the asset cap. So when we started learning about this, it sounded incredibly attractive. Uh, I did a lot of research on it. I contacted my brother and sister-in-law, uh, and they said, well, we've heard about it. The social worker says she's not eligible. So I thought that was merely a mistake on the part of the local social worker. You know, it's 
there are so many programs in Medi-Cal, it would make sense that you know, perhaps what, the social worker didn't know about this particular one. Only about 1% of all Medi-Cal recipients are enrolled in it. When I was talking to the state level officials, I s related this story. And the state level person said, yeah, she's not eligible, which just seemed, you know, how could that possibly be the case? And so it turns out that um, because she's in a version of Medi-Cal for which she does not have to pay a monthly premium, they, the, the program is barred from making her, quote, worse off by moving her into this CWD program for which you actually would pay a very modest monthly pay, uh, premium to be in Medi-Cal. So they're barred from moving her from free Medi-Cal into a version of Medi-Cal for which you'd have to pay a monthly premium. This monthly premium would save them a tremendous amount of money over the sort of share of cost version of Medi-Cal. Um, the way that she would need to get into this would be to leave Medi-Cal, get a job, re-enter Medi-Cal under the CWD program and hope that there wasn't a gap in coverage in going through that process. And my brother and sister-in-law are petrified at the prospect of doing that because the, I, you know, the chance that that's all going to work without a hitch is very low. And they have, they have good personal reason to be, uh, you know, to, to worry that this is not going to work, that this may not work. At one point, they take their son, who's supposed to have insurance, to the doctor, public insurance, and they find out he's not covered. He's not in the system as having insurance. Well, how can that be? No one can tell them. Again, when I was talking to the state level officials, you know, why, why was my nephew kicked out of the program? The state level person looks in the record and says, well, the termination code is number 99, which is just the catch-all code. Uh, no specific reason attached. It just means that he wasn't kicked out for reasons 1 through 98. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a level of complexity we're talking about. Well, and as you so aptly describe it in the book, you call it falling down the, the rabbit hole, the, the social mm -hmm. safety net uh, rabbit hole, which is it's very much like a Alice in Wonderland uh, right. uh, situation. Absolutely. And I would like to maybe invite Michael and Rachel up here now, and we can jo to join the conversation. And um, I think maybe just if you just take a couple of minutes just to, if you have one or two comments, and then well, we can have Well, I, I, I read the book, and uh, uh, as an organization that works on uh, really trying to find ways to help people with disabilities find a pathway to greater economic stability and, and uh, uh, some level of quality of life, as you, as you described, um, I still, it was a page turner for me uh, because it, is, it isn't a portrait of one family. It's a portrait of millions of families across this country who are faced with similar issues. Um, uh, one person, one researcher once said, when you see one me state Medicaid plan, you've seen one state Medicaid plan. <laughs> because in fact, each state has 10, 20 possible other waivers, permutations, you just described a few. And so even with your incredible educational background, what happens to the average family? What happens to the individual who is not supported by a husband, but acquires a disability and doesn't have that circle of support? Um, we live in a society that should be doing better. And your book really illustrates that um, we have uh, a maze of public policy that isn't aligned with the idea that people, whether they were born with a disability or acquire a disability, should be able to have some social safety net that is not complex, but is simple to navigate, that has the right incentives to want to work, to live independently, uh, to be part of their community, to be part of the economic mainstream. We have a long way to go. Thank you. Rachel? I just want to reiterate what uh, both of you have said. This is an incredibly compelling story. You know, as somebody who deals regularly with a lot of uh, the complexities of social assistance programs and their rules, um, reading this was um, almost like seeing the movie when you've already read the book, right? You know how it ends, you know how challenging it is, and you just can't turn away from it. Um, I think there are a couple of themes, you know, from our assets perspective that I just sort of like to. Uh, lend to some of uh, what you were discussing in the book. I mean, the first is just how convoluted it is, right? They're incredibly convoluted. A lot of program rules are set at the federal level, some are at the state. They're implemented differently. What counts as an asset uh, it varies. Um, when West Virginia still had their asset limit for SNAP, 
um, formerly food stamps, uh, things like mineral rights or the value of your RV were things that you'd have to document when you went in to apply for assistance. Um, that really doesn't make any sense. And oftentimes these result in just very uh, arbitrary outcomes. Uh, Illinois, for instance, has uh, eliminated both their TANF and their SNAP asset limit. Um, so people who apply for the program there can have a modest amount of money in their bank account and still receive assistance. Uh, Indiana, in contrast, has the lowest um, asset limits in the state at $2,000 for SNAP and $1,000 for TANF. So families with the exact same financial circumstances have very different experiences when it comes to accessing the program, navigating the system, figuring out what the rules are, and also sort of what their financial circumstances are uh, when they're accessing the program. Um, this is something else I wanted to mention was just uh, how counterproductive they are. You know, ostensibly the objectives um, of the programs are to help families achieve a level of financial security uh, and be able to successfully transition off, um, not having any kind of buffer against just the vicissitudes of life. Um, it is, makes that very challenging. It also makes making just small adjustments in your life that would lead uh, to greater financial security very challenging to do, like uh, getting your car repaired that you need to go to work. Uh, this is necessary for maintaining a job and having secure income. Uh, if you wanted to um, take a class at your local community college, right, to increase your credentials or your education so you can increase your potential earnings, you know, that's off the table too, you know. Um, several years before coming to New America, I worked with families who are in uh, the foster care system, and uh, there was one parent who lived in a hotel. This is because she didn't have first and last month's rent, you know, to put down to be able to live in some kind of stable housing situation, which certainly would have been helpful uh, for the stability of her family and would have been lower cost over time just because she didn't have access to just a very modest amount of resources uh, that, that made that challenging. Um, you also mentioned administrative costs. This is often used as, um, I think, a justification for why these eligible, uh, eligibility rules need to be as strict as they are to make sure that they're targeted, to make sure that lottery winners aren't on the program. But in reality, uh, this is just a very extensive uh, search for a needle in a haystack. You know, when Illinois uh, got rid of their TANF asset limit, they found that um, eight people the previous year had been disqualified for having assets in excess of their $3,000 limit. Um, on the other hand, they estimated that they saved a million dollars in administrative cost. So if you just sort of crunch the numbers on that in the back of the envelope, you know, they wouldn't have needed to have recouped you know, about $125,000 per TANF family uh, to make uh, the justification for having that asset limit in place. In reality, <laughs> these families have about $5,000 annually in cost. Uh, so this is really just an argument that's really thin. And just finally to say that the way that we treat families uh, in public assistance programs is just in such sharp contrast to other kinds of social policy. You know, when we look at um, our national policies to support savings, for instance, you know, nationally we spend about half a trillion dollars a year to help families uh, save and build assets uh, through home ownership, through retirement, and through other means because this is sort of a shared national value. Um, the way that these incentives are structured, they're almost entirely administered through the tax code, so they necessarily flow up the income scale. So the better off you are, the more subsidy you get for the savings, um, whereas families who are the most vulnerable and who could benefit the most uh, from these kinds of supports are explicitly restricted from saving and taking the exact same, same kind of actions that we incentivize for higher income families. Um, thank you. Um, I, and I guess that so brings me to one of my questions, and that is, you know, but politically, it's, uh, you know, what do you say to the person who, or the public, you know, if you're a politician and somebody says, but somebody who was a lottery winner did in fact, you know, get some of these benefits, or somebody who has a Mercedes, you know, got, got better, you, you, the, you always hear those stories. So politically, I mean, how, how can these things be changed in our current political system um, 
given that, you know, nobody wants to defend somebody, say, who, who does have wealth. I mean, should there be some asset limits? Um, or, or, or is it just that they're too low? Or is it that the argument that you're making just isn't out there enough that in the long run it's, you know, more cost uh, beneficial? to not have the asset limits? I, I think there's multiple ways to come at an answer to that. I, I think, in general, um, th the notion that disability is a natural part of the human experience is a myth. Um, to policymakers, it's not a myth. It happened in your family. It's the story of the book. It happens to families uh, every day somewhere in this country. But policymakers tend to be immune from what their context or experience. Uh, having worked on Capitol Hill, I've seen the policymakers at both ends of the ideological spectrum, Republicans and Democrats, when suddenly a child was born in the family, an uncle was injured on the job, uh, 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 a member of the family acquired a disability in a car accident, you would be shocked at how quickly their view, their lens changes. I do think this notion that of welfare fraud, which the media has perpetuated, is an extraordinary disservice to people at the lower end of, of the economic spectrum uh, didn't get there because of something they did. They either, it was acquired at birth or it was acquired through accident or something else, or now we have uh, the wounded warriors who acquired it by serving their country and, and trying to protect all of us. And yet there isn't this understanding that why for any of those individuals shouldn't they have a safety net that has two things. It protects against absolute, utter poverty, homelessness, hunger, access to health care, but at the same time also provides incentives for husband and wife or, or members of a family, as well as the person with a disability, to work, to be able to save, to create assets. Our policies aren't there. And uh, raising the asset limits, um, I think, uh, as much as I'd love to see uh, with this Congress, previous Congresses, or future Congresses, that we're, we're going to get to the point where they'll be wiped out. Although, as you described, the state experiences show that, uh, in fact, um, uh, there isn't a breaking of the bank. There aren't all these thousands of people that are suddenly going to take advantage of this. I think what happens is really that uh, we'll see more likely, I hope, as the president, this president and other presidents have recommended, and there are actually some people at both ends of the ideological spectrum uh, who, who believe that raising the asset limits makes sense. Uh, simply as a point, as you made, about an alignment of social policy. What does it say about who we are as a country with all the wealth that we have that we, who could survive on $2,000? No emergency funds, no incentive to put any money aside, which means no incentive to work. It doesn't make sense. Andrea, what, so what do you think are some of the biggest impediments to change? Well, there are many. I mean, unfortunately, there are these vivid anecdotes, right? The lottery winner who's on, on TANF, and those tend to, those well, tend I don't to know seize. Who that is, but exactly. <laughs> they tend to seize the public imagination, um, as opposed to you know, people underestimating the actual likelihood of disability. Um, and so there's a sort of mismatch between these one off anecdotes and the actual rates in our population. Um, uh, I, you know, one thing is that uh, people underestimate disability, not, not even, uh, the, the, the one age group in which we might think that people will be most likely to understand the disability is a, population, uh, is a possibility is in the older population, and even there we tend to underestimate it. You know, at age 65, your likelihood of needing home health care at some point during the rest of your life is 72% and your likelihood of needing some institutional care is 49%. Those are very large numbers, and yet there's, there's a lot of silence around disability, um, denial that this is gonna happen to you or in your family, um, and also just lack of information. Lots of people think that health insurance covers uh, these, this kind of care or that Medicare covers it, and that is, that is not the case. Um, as to asset limits, uh, you know, there have been proposals, for example, in the federal means tested programs to lift the asset cap to say $10,000. So that means it would apply for SSI, food stamps, the other federal social assistance programs. The only problem is that if you had a 10,000 cap at the federal level, but then an individual was under the state's Medicaid cap of $3,000, then that federal lift is not gonna help you. So there needs to be really wide consideration um, across, across states and the federal government about what these asset caps, you know, where, where to put them at. 
Um, I think a lot of people thought that the Affordable Care Act might address some of the concerns that, uh, um, uh, and some of the issues that were raised in your family's mm -hmm. um, experience. What impact did it have, right. and what impact didn't it have that you had <laughs> sort of thought it might? Right. Well, the ACA was principally about health insurance and extending health insurance to more folks and to um, uh, addressing some of the difficulties in the existing, the pre-existing individual health insurance market with, with more stringent regulations. Uh, the ACA, as it exists now, um, leaves many of the, the issues for the disabled on the table. There was a component of the ACA called the CLASS Act, Community Living Assistant, Assistance, and I forget the S and the S. Um, this would have been a, a social insurance version of long-term care where people could pay in a, a payroll tax after they would be vested after five years, and then, they, then if they were to become disabled at any age, they could get a modest daily benefit that might offset part of the cost of home health care or institutional care. Um, the actuarial problem with the CLASS Act is that it was a voluntary program. Um, with voluntary programs, we worry that only the people most likely to use it would enroll, which would create a sort of death spiral um, in an insurance sense. And so uh, even though it was part of the ACA as the law was passed, uh, shortly thereafter, the HHS secretary declared that, that, that it was not going to be implemented because it was not sustainable, and then it was formally repealed as part of the fiscal cliff bill that, that Congress passed. So now we're, we're back to square one, uh, actually, in terms of, in terms of you know, the fact that, that uh, the services that the disabled need are primarily still covered through Medicaid uh, without the, the ACA not really touching them. Right, right. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Or? Well, I'd say uh, for people who are eligible for Medicaid outside of their disability status, I mean, there were some provisions in the ACA um, in addition to eliminating the, uh, the asset limit for, um, for Medicaid for the expansion groups. I mean, it also provides some funds for states to experiment with streamlining their eligibility process. So in California, for instance, um, they have uh, instituted express lane eligibility. So if um, your uh, if you're eligible or participating in SNAP, then you're categorically eligible for Medicaid. So that helps with uh, navigating and standardizing some of the eligibility criteria. Um, but of course, you know, as you say, there are so many people who are outside of that process that it's still um, it, it is still a goal that is sort of yet to be attained at scale. I, I just might add to that is it goes back to the point you made earlier, which is depending on where you live in this country, what state? depending on uh, even at times what age you acquired your disability, mm -hmm. um, uh, depending on the social, political, economic environment that uh, in one state makes sure that you have long-term services and supports for people with certain types of disability for certain types of services, and yet just cross the border and travel 10 miles into another state, and if you by some chance happen to live there, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a policy that really has not addressed. I think it is really not understood about the Affordable Care Act um, that maybe this was a first step, and it certainly has a lot of advantages for lots of people who are, who are uninsured, but we haven't tackled the big issue with a country where the demographics show an aging America, uh, as well as people with disabilities at any age that they acquire their disability, uh, 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 personal care assistance, uh, adaptive technology, um, uh, just so many things that are not typically going to be covered by any health exchange under ACCA and are not going to be covered by any state Medicaid plan for an awful lot of people with disabilities. Um, Michael, you, you mentioned before that um, there were people on both sides of the political spectrum who were sort of recognizing that maybe assets are a good thing for people to have um, and that asset limits might not be so good. Um, and, and I'm curious from all of you if you think, you know, we've, we've had um, Congressman Paul Ryan present a, an anti-poverty plan and some of the other Republicans are talking about fighting poverty. And one of the things they do talk about is simplifying things, you know, that we have this very convoluted system making it simpler and to have the focus to get people out of poverty. Um, I'm curious if you see some hope there for some kind of solutions that you would think was uh, favorable or beneficial or not. Go ahead. Who wants go to go ahead. first? <laughs> I'll, I'll tackle it, but I'd love to hear the, the new America. Uh, 
I think I would have concerns that getting people out of poverty is really a, a euphemism for off of programs. You know, I think this is something that we saw play out with welfare reform in 96. The way that we define the goals for re what reform looked like uh, really had to do with reducing the roles rather than transitioning people to sustainable employment, making sure that they had access to the supportive services that they need, like childcare, like transportation, to sustain that employment. Um, I think that there are some positive attributes and some aspects of the plan, like increasing the earned income tax credit for childless workers. This is something that's long overdue. Um, and I appreciate the rhetoric about simplification and standardization. Um, I think that there are other aspects of the pr proposal that would call into question um, how this vision would end up being implemented. Uh, for example, uh, assigning each, um, each family within the system a caseworker to help set goals, to keep them accountable, um, and impose sanctions you know, if they did not adhere to this plan. I think this is just sort of based on the assumption that people are poor because they're unable to manage their lives and their finances. And I think this is so divorced from the reality of why so many families are, are financially insecure, um, that this misalignment between the diagnosis of the problem and the treatment of the problem uh, would not result in positive outcomes for, for poor families. Oh, I would you know, second what you said. And um, I, you know, it's not just a, I think oftentimes we focus on these programs and the people in these programs without realizing it's, it's, a, it's a larger problem of what do programs provide? What do low-wage jobs provide? And if we kick people off of programs and dump them into these low-wage jobs where it's not a living wage and there are no benefits, there's no you know, health insurance. Well, now there's a source of health insurance, but there's you know, no help with childcare and all these other services that people need that we can't, you know, as you're saying, we can't just simply push people off of programs when there's no supports on the outside. That's just not a tenable proposition. I guess I'd make a couple of points. One is, um, I, I'll take it as a positive on a very conceptual level that Paul Ryan actually submitted a, a plan to reduce poverty in America. That means that across the ideological spectrum, there's an interest. Now, the devil's in the details. And uh, 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 I, I, I think uh, there's a rare agreement, but there is on uh, expansion of the earned income tax credit, reducing the age, uh, expanding benefits for someone who's not part of a family but a single household, which affects a lot of people with disabilities, that's a positive. But I think, you know, fundamentally, when I read your book, what really I, I thought it captured better than probably anything I've read in years, and, or actually the personal stories we experience every day with work with, uh, in the National Disability Institute, and that is a lack of understanding of the extra costs every day of living with a disability. Because of those extra costs, the asset limits are a farce. They're, they're absolutely show no understanding that uh, what researchers have, have proven over and over again. To raise a child with a disability, depending on the nature of that disability, two, three, can even be 10 times the cost of raising a child without disability. For an adult, like your sister-in-law, uh, a long life, we hope, ahead of her, uh, the cost she will have to face and her family with your brother will have to face two to three times the cost that uh, other families may face. Our social policy isn't aligned to support that reality. It's not a part of what we do. Why do you think, I, mean, I think, and I come across this repeatedly in, in, in reporting, I'm sure you guys come across this issue too, that, you know, that people will make the argument that the long-term benefit so overwhelms the cost to society of, I mean, the cost of maybe ha increased payments that they would have to make or supports for these families, that, 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 that we would get more money back actually in, in t you know, taxes that people would pay if they were able to work, you know, uh, uh, the same thing like say with, with your brother. Why do you think that argument just doesn't sell? Is it that just that, that the public policy is just too short-sighted, or why, why, you know, why can't that argument be made that in the long run, society would be better off if your brother and sister-in-law were supported in a way that they could, in fact, work their way up into the middle class and not have to, as you say, impoverish themselves just to survive? 
Yeah, well, a lot of it has to do with you know, what you think the po causes of poverty are. Are they individual shortcomings or are they systemic reasons? And I think there are many policymakers who believe that's because of individual shortcomings. These people you know, just don't want to work or, and so on. Um, and that's, that's not the case. So I think that's, that's, that's one issue. I think uh, rather remarkable and may play out over the next uh, uh, several weeks with the lame duck session of Congress. There is a piece of legislation. This is the fourth consecutive term of Congress, that it has uh, been put before the Congress. It's called the ABLE Act, the Achieving Better Life Experience Act. It will create a tax advantage savings program uh, for individuals with disabilities, could be set up by a family, could be set up by uh, the person with a disability, friends, or otherwise, that will allow savings that uh, not only can grow without being taxed on when you take the money out, but will also recognize the extra cost of living a life with a disability. It could be for higher education, it could be to help with employment, transportation, extra costs of health care, purchase of technology, personal assistance services. This bill, surprisingly, has 350 members of the House of Representatives who have signed on as co-sponsors, and it has 70 senators. So why? Why did that happen? <laughs> Um, I think that uh, this is one of those uh, really uh, uh, behind the headline stories of incredible persistence and determination across the disability community. People with physical disabilities, people with sensory disabilities, people with acquired disabilities versus uh, at birth. Um, uh, and it didn't happen overnight. This is the, you know, this is the third or fourth try at this. Um, now. In the closing hours before the August recess, they knocked down who was eligible from anyone up to age 64 who could create an ABLE account or have an ABLE account created to you had to be age 26 or younger. And so that eliminated lots and lots of people. Lots of people. <laughs> and what was the reason? Cost. Uh, so there's a mixed story there. I think if it does pass, this, uh, to me, uh, will, uh, um, once, once it plays out, uh, take care of the issue uh, uh, for some people, but not everyone. Many, many people will not have the money to put into this type of account. So this does not eliminate at all the need and the, and, and the compelling arguments for eliminating asset limits. I would just jump in and second what Andrea said. And, you know, I think th th the lack of traction for a lot of the policies that we're advocating on behalf of, I mean, it has to do with uh, a basic mistrust of people in poverty and um, an understanding of who's deserving and undeserving. Um, you know, if we were making policy based on data, our social safety net look, would look very different than the way that it does. It would be much more robust. It would cut, catch people at a much higher level rather than imposing a level of destitution that makes it very challenging really for anybody uh, to ascend out of. Um, so instead of having a more robust, um, more flexible uh, social safety net, what we have instead is one that uh, imposes asset limits and requires families to document uh, their, their lack of resources, even though we know this is contrary uh, either to their interest um, as well as to the state's bottom line. And we also see sort of the pervasive uptake of things like drug testing for welfare recipients, I mean, which has sh shown really the exact same outcomes as a of asset testing. Um, states are end up ending up having to pay out reimbursements uh, for the cost of the test uh, to a, a level that far exceeds whatever they're recouping from lost benefits. Uh, so we're, we're not talking about data, we're talking about ideology. And I think until there's a major shift in that direction, we're gonna continue really the same trends uh, that we're seeing now. Um, so I'd like to turn it over if, uh, if we have questions from the audience, yes? Yeah. Oh, we actually, if you could just wait uh, for the mic. Yes, so you know better than I do, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Dave Price. I'm an educational consultant working in urban areas, so I see this play out, although it's not just in urban areas all the time. So my question is this, uh, kind of preface it this way. It seems at times we have a federal government that is dysfunctional and has an empathy temperature about 11 degrees less than that outside. And we see that play out at the state level. Now here we have a program, we have federal and state involved. So to anyone on the panel, would it be better uh, if just it were controlled by one 
That is my first question. In other words, does the convolu convolution of the two uh, enter into problems? And, and, and secondly, kind of uh, obviously not going to happen, but suppose uh, your phone rings, cell phone rings at the end of this, and it's President Obama, and he said, I, was, I, I heard you had this talk, and I'd like you to just give me one piece of advice that would you know, really be a start for helping people get out of this safety net trap. What would you tell him? So both of those questions, if you would, please. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just say on the, you know, the sort of state versus federal issue, um, there's a chapter in the book where I talk about the tremendous variation across states uh, in the way these programs are run, eligibility uh, criteria, benefit levels, and so on. And I have my political science colleagues have said, you know, your chapter is very ambivalent about state variation in the sense that um, if we had a uniform policy and it was Massachusetts level, to my mind, fantastic. If we had a uniform policy and it was Texas level, not so good. Uh, so, you know, that's the problem with uniformity is like at what level uh, is the uniformity taking place? Um, and then, you know, in terms of your specific question, federal versus state, there's a lot of coordination, coordination issues that are, that are very complicated and add to this general level of, of complexity. Um, as for President Obama, advice to him, <laughs> lift the asset test for all the federal programs at least. That's sort of a glib answer. Yeah, um, since uh, we seem to have moved to an age of executive order, uh, <laughs> lift the asset limits by executive order um, and let, let the Congress uh, challenge back as to whether he has the authority to do that. I would agree with you. Uh, but I, I would say this, this uh, unknown piece of legislation that I, that I talked about, the Achieving Better Life Experience Act, uh, which uh, um, although they brought the eligibility down, so you would have had to have acquired a disability only up to age 26, is a foot in the door that for the first time recognizes there are extra costs of living a life with a disability. And uh, we're not going to means test the entitlements. We're going to let you hold on to them, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's uh, food assistance, whether it's housing assistance or other things. Um, it's a step in the right direction, and it's really an educable moment for everyone to step back and think about, that may happen to me and my family, and this is a much more rational uh, social policy. But I, it will only help some, and uh, one can't do that uh, uh, without lifting the asset limits for everyone. Of eliminating <laughs> asset limits wholesale. Um, as for uh, state variation, I think that, you know, on the whole, uh, enabling states to be able to make calls on their own policies um, is sensible and something that we've seen play out in positive ways. You know, 36 states have completely eliminated their, their asset limit. Um, for, um, for SNAP. Um, this is something that uh, attempted to be. Uh, that discontinued in the last reauthorization of, um, of the farm bill, um, but has persisted. Um, I think what we're missing is reasonable standards uh, about where states are able to set uh, those, those eligibility criteria. Um, I think for the most part, they're, they're far too low. And you know, just as we have you know, in the context of, you know, say, education, and something that we don't have right now. Hi, uh, Charles Hughes. I was just wondering if you saw cash diversion, lump sum cash payments, playing any kind of complementary role. You both mentioned, I think, emergencies like repairing your car, meeting rent. Do you think that has any role to play in what you envision the safety net being? Cash payments from where, what source? Can you yeah. use the mic? I'm sorry. Sorry, it's, it's, it's through TANF. Mm -hmm. So whoever is administrating TANF at the state level, uh, some states have the program, some don't. And it's expanded since it was authorized with uh, the 96 welfare reform. Just wondering if you thought it could help with some of these emergencies and the lack of savings that a lot of these families have because they're prevented from saving. Mm. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that program. So it sounds like if there is an emergency, that they can get an, a, a loan. Is it a loan or a grant from? It's a lump sum 
a lump sum payment. Um, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I'll just say one thing about the, the lack of assets is it, helping people meet emergencies might be a, a, a good thing, but there's more to assets than just that. Um, you know, assets have intergenerational consequences. You know, economists have done studies looking at low-income households, and low-income households that have high a like higher assets, those children have later on in life better economic mobility than the low-income households that also have low assets. So it's not just about meeting a given emergency, it's about what are the prospects for this family in general, and what are the kinds of investments they can make in the next generation as well. So that, that program sounds like a, a nice start, but I think it's not a replacement for um, the value of sort of having an ongoing set of assets at your disposal. Yeah, I would jump in and say that, you know, I think there are probably other mechanisms rather than this cash, cash advance, which effectively what it, what it is through TANF. Only about 40% of eligible families are even participating in TANF. It's a very limited, tool, uh, I think something that would probably um, help meet meet the moment, meet the financial needs, as well as help families sort of the age of their lives uh, that I think is incredibly limited uh, within the public assistance system based on these kind of rules that, that limit their access to other kind of financial resources is just expanding uh, the ki kinds of policies that we have for people on the upper end to families on the lower end, you know, the ones that expand access to uh, financial products and incentives that has been demonstrated to be successful uh, in places where it's been practiced. Uh, the city of New York since 2008 uh, has had a program called Save NYC. It's been subsequently other cities now is Save USA and you know effectively um, you show up at tax time, you file your taxes and you're given the opportunity uh, to get uh, to get a match if you set aside you know a, a few dollars of your tax refund uh, and save it for a year and you know so far it's been hugely successful you know in the first few years you know 80 percent of the participants uh, successfully saved for the entire year and they saved about six hundred dollars of their own money uh, and these are among families whose average earnings were about eighteen thousand dollars and this is eighteen thousand dollars in new york so this is new york money not rest of the world money uh, so their their resources are incredibly limited they still manage to do this successfully so you know i think um I think if we operated from, you know, if you build it, will they, you know, they will come kind of perspective, you know, extending these kinds of incentives and access points uh, would be, uh, would help families have these kind of buffer and be able to make these longer term investments. Hi, I'm TJ Sutcliffe with The ARC. Thank you so much for the book and for today's panel. Um, I wonder if, the, if you might comment on, um, beyond sort of the added costs of having a disability, um, what I think of as sort of the time tax associated both with trying to navigate some of these systems as well as um, the time tax associated with living under an asset limit where you have to so very carefully manage both all of your income as well as, and the flow of your income as well as your assets, which can be um, in and of itself, I think, pretty complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say, you know, watching my brother and sister-in-law um, operate, it, well, first of all, I should say uh, they were actually living apart for two years because uh, one thing for which there is no public help at all is renovating your home for wheelchair accessibility. So friends uh, worked nights and weekends for two years to renovate their home. So uh, with Dave and Marcella living with different relatives in the meantime, now that they're back under the same roof, you know, the time crunch is as acute or even more acute than the money crunch. And I realized that the way that, the way that you can make a really tight budget work is if you substitute your time. If you, you know, cook from scratch, if you make your car parts from metal, <laughs> you know, sheet metal. Um, and uh, yeah, the time crunch is so, so severe um, and exacerbated by the fact that when they did move back in together, um, the state actually cut her personal care hours because the assumption was that, well, the husband will do more of the care. Um, so that's cut into his sleep. Well, it's cut into a lot of things. Um, yeah, and so they, they face, you know, a time famine, a time crunch, which is just unbelievable. 
and, um, and I think as you made a point in the book, and it, it, you know, they have a big support system around them. You know, you're not talking about just their own time. It's all their friends' time and, and family time. I mean, you wonder how anybody who didn't have this big support system could ever survive. Right. You know, she has a large family that, that participate in her personal care, uh, and they have a large number of friends. I mean, this is our hometown. This is where we grew up. So these are friends from elementary school, literally, who are picking up my, my nephew uh, and taking him around town and so on. Um, and if it were not for that support network, you know, sometimes people ask me, well, why don't they move to a state with better provision? Um, well, one problem is that some states have time uh, limit, or you know, there's, there's a gap after you move to the state before you can receive services, a gap that they could not afford to cover on their own. But the other thing is they can't leave this network behind because even the most generous state's provisions doesn't come close to meeting all of your needs that are filled in by friends and family um, who they couldn't possibly leave behind. There, there are uh, so many anecdotal examples I think of over the years where uh, one of the breadwinners, husband or wife, gets a great job offer in another state, but they're raising a child with a significant disability. They cannot take that offer on uh, because a different set of benefits, waiting lists, sometimes uh, two years, sometimes 10 years. Mm -hmm. and, and so again, about where you live in this country is going to affect you in dramatic ways when you're facing the kinds of challenges that uh, your family story brings us. Um, Rachel, one, one thing that you brought up, I, I, you, you were talking about how only about, I think, 40% of the people who are eligible for TANF or actually on the program, is, it, is that the number? And, and, and that's true of most social safety net programs that a very limited portion of the people who are eligible um, are on them. And do you think it's because of the um, asset tests or the other rules, or is it just because it's so complicated, or is it because people don't really know that they exist? Um, is it because the state does, or the uh, locality doesn't do a good job at getting the message out? What, what is the main thing that's stopping so many people from participating in these programs? Well, it's all of those things. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's a constellation of barriers. Uh, for, for programs like TANF or child care, I mean, it's a resource issue, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, TANF is uh, block granted. It has not been updated for inflation. Its funding hasn't been updated uh, since 1996, even though demand has, in fact, gone up. We had a recession. Uh, a lot more people had increased need, but you didn't see uh, enrollment in the program uh, go up. And a lot of it was because it, the resources are just constrained in that particular way. Um, Sometimes it also has to do with the mechanism um, by which the program is offered. Uh, you know, even for SNAP, which has a fairly robust comparatively, you know, participation rate at you know about two thirds of eligible um, households are enrolled in SNAP, you s it's still an incredibly burdensome process, right? You know, uh, it, the amount of documentation you have to provide, having to take time off of work, having to go to uh, speak with a caseworker, uh, all this is incredibly involved. And you know, on top of that, you also have the recertifications and uh, it's incredibly kind, time consuming and disruptive. I mean, this is in contrast with you know, programs like the EITC, you know, uh, check a box on your tax form and you know, participation in that program is substantially higher because um, that is the mechanism by which we also distribute it, tax incentives to you know higher income families. This is a very standardized, low bar, um, and I think if this is something that we could replicate at you know a, a larger level, hopefully you would see participation um, in these programs increase. You know as well as provide for funding structures that allow need to be met in the first place. But related to the earned income tax credit. Uh, we've been working with the IRS for the past 10 years. We've helped uh, over 2 million people with disabilities for the first time because they were uninformed, actually access the earned income tax credit, receive over $2 billion in tax refunds uh, collectively over, the, over that 10 year period. And despite all our media push, despite our collaborations with all kinds of organizations across the country, both with people with disabilities and other low income people without disabilities, it's still running about 20%. Uh, are leaving billions of dollars, not individually, but collectively on the table that the earned income tax credit was supposed to make. And it gets back to your point, is just the layers, the maze, the, uh, the rabbit hole, whatever you want to call it is, um, uh, back to the, the question, is who has the time, 
who has the knowledge, who has the skill. And is that really the purpose of our social policy, to make it more difficult, or actually to try to get people uh, the social safety net that they need? Uh, Dave Oxter, Research Institute for Independent Living. Uh, in the case of uh, your brother and your uh, sister-in-law, did SSDI have any role in alleviating problems? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so to be eligible for the social insurance programs, SSDI, part of Social Security and, and Medicare, uh, which pr does provide health insurance for uh, permanently disabled people in addition to senior citizens, you have to have worked enough quarters to be considered an insured worker and because my sister-in-law had gone back to school, she had not worked enough quarters to be an insured worker. Uh, so she was not eligible for SSDI or Medicare. Now, as it turns out, uh, it's a little moot because even if she were in Medicare, there's a couple of problems. Medicare has a 24-month wait, waiting period for the disabled, which is really a 29-month waiting period because you have to wait five months to be eligible for SSDI and then the 24-month waiting period for Medicare starts. And so during that period, oftentimes people have to go on Medicaid anyway. It's the only form of health insurance. And then for her, there's the additional difficulty that she needs personal care assistance, and Mer Medicare does not cover that on a long-term basis. So even if she had been an insured worker, she might very likely have been on Medicaid in the end uh, to get the, that set of services. I just want to go back to your example about, you said your brother spent two years trying to, to uh, make their, their home accessible, mm -hmm. and you said no public uh, program covers that. This is again about where you live. Mm -hmm. So in New York City, in Austin, Texas, and I could name about 12 other uh, cities around the country, they're using HUD community development block grant funds just for that purpose mm -hmm. and help hundreds of people in their respective cities. That doesn't meet the full demand, mm -hmm. But it's again about the complexity of all of this. Where do I find this out? Who do I talk to? Uh, how am I going to learn? It's pretty difficult. Right. There's actually a wonderful book, a new book by sociologist Sandra Levitsky called Caring for Our Own, which is about uh, uh, long-term care issues. And she's, she interviews uh, adult children of Alzheimer's patients and their struggle to get services for their parents. And one of the central themes is, you know, in a federal system, we have some programs at the federal level, some at the state level, some at the local level. There's no central clearinghouse of information. It's very difficult to figure out, like, what services are available? What are you eligible for? Uh, it's just difficult to negotiate the system because it's so complex and decentralized. Although some places, aren't they trying to try and coordinate it a little bit more, like having a one-stop shop? I thought some... Yeah, uh, states uh, and, in, and localities. In what's now called the Administration on Community Living, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, they've created a network of what are called Aging and Disability Resource Centers. There aren't enough of them. Many people have never heard of them. And so, you, you know, again, you, you have further challenges. Under ACCA, they created something called Patient Navigators. In the Workforce Investment Act, or now Workforce Opportunity and Innovation Act, uh, we, we created something called Disability Program Navigators. What does it again tell you about social policy when we created this rabbit hole you jump down or find yourself in and that now we're going to pay for navigators because you can't figure it out yourself. And lots of different kinds of navigators, of it sounds kinds. like. <laughs> and get um, the navigators to talk to each other. Right, right, right. And I'm sorry, we have another question here. So it seems like two of the themes that have come up a lot today, one is this idea of people making the policy or implementing the policy, not fully understanding what's happening to people on the benefits, and then the people who are trying to receive the benefits maybe not understanding the details of what's happening sort of on the higher level and what actually exists and how to access it. So I was curious what solutions you all have seen or ideas that you have of how to improve the lines of communication um, between those two groups. Um, there's a wonderful example uh, of, a, of a technology platform that uh, actually was created with funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the U.S. Uh, it's called TIES, T-Y-Z-E, Personal Networks. Mm -hmm. And it's based on this, uh, basically what your brother and sister-in-law have created informally. It provides a technology platform. I would consider it something between LinkedIn and Facebook, mm -hmm. but very simple and elegant in design. And uh, it's connecting the paid caregivers with families and friends. It has a calendar of events. It has a, a vault where you can uh, lock up uh, 
uh, important documents, uh, uh, list of medications, doctor's list if you're in an emergency. It has a message board. But it's about just trying to improve communication uh, between that, that network of people that uh, might uh, really be mobilized. Um, there are 10,000 ties personal networks in Canada. It was proven to actually reduce social isolation and actually reduce healthcare costs because it eliminated visits to the emergency room. It eliminated things that happen when people don't take their medications because no one reminded them. So it does a lot, lot of things and uh, we're actually working with them now to try to bring this to the United States. I mean, there's some other sort of technology-based platforms that are taking place, you know, within the public assistance space. You know, I think Code for America has been very active in creating uh, sort of local uh, local resources that um, you know families can tap into to identify uh, things like where they can use their TANF EBT card uh, without facing uh, withdrawal penalties. I mean, this is something that unfortunately is pervasive uh, within uh, the way that a lot of um, means-tested benefits are distributed. Um, a, a lot of them are becoming based on cards and um, you have usage fees, you have withdrawal fees, um, basically it's an access fee on your public benefit. Um, setting aside all the issues related to that. Um, having, having an app that allows you to identify where you can access these fees, or access, uh, access um, your benefits without having to face these fees is important. Again, you have to know that these things exist, right? And they don't exist everywhere. So there are some very severe limitations on uh, how beneficial they can be. And again, I think, Michael, it goes back to your point. I mean, what does it say about our social assistance system that we have to engage such a broad community uh, of people to help people access the benefits that ostensibly that they're entitled to. Um, so we're coming to a close and before we leave I was hoping that Andrea um, it, could you just talk a little bit about you know at this point looking forward if things don't change, wh wh what do you see as the prospects for your, um, you know, your your brother and sister-in-law and and their child, their young child? Um, how are things going now, and what do you see there as their future? Yeah, um, well, there, there are good aspects. I mean, they they are so happy to be under the same roof now, finally. Um, and my nephew is very cute. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint slide of him. <laughs> it's very photogenic. That would be important. Yes. That's right. Um, so there are some positive aspects. Um, you know, there, there's been wonderful generosity in the community. Uh, when they did rebuild their home, a lot of the, the materials were donated uh, or provided at cost. Um, he, he goes to uh, preschool several days a week. Uh, basically, the, the, the preschool associated with our elementary school um, took him on as a, quote, scholarship student. So he has a place to go when my brother is at work. Um, so there, there, are, there are positive developments in that, in that sense. Um, it's also, they're confronting a lot of challenges now. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, her personal care hours have been cut now that they are living under the same roof. And um, my, which they've been doing since April, um, my brother is really exhausted because he gets up every four or five hours uh, to, to meet her needs and never gets a full night's sleep. And so what we're trying to do right now is figure out some system of respite care just so he can go and sleep for a weekend at a friend's house uh, on a regular basis. Uh, trying to figure that out, not sure the source of that's going to be. Um, and then, you know, uh, long term, you know, she was in nursing school. She would love to go back to nursing school. She's obviously not going to be a floor nurse, but there's many things that she could do, patient education, reading films, and so on. It's unclear whether the nursing program will allow her back in um, or whether the state of California would license her as a nurse. So that's a set of challenges. Um, you know, what, what could she do? She's a very bright person, you know, and like I said, she's in her mid-30s. She has decades to give to society if only we could figure out a way for her, for her to do so. Um, and then there's a the question of my, my little nephew. Um, you know, I will make sure that if he wants to go to college, he can go to college. Um, but, you know, under the, under the existing system, that's not, not a given. I'm just lucky to be in a position to, to try to make that happen for him. Yeah, I was wondering um, if it would be prevented from doing that, actually. By well, the once he's 18, test. right, okay. once he's 18, I can help him. Yeah, um, yeah I just can't help him now, uh, officially, right? <laughs> so, so good and bad things, you know, looking, looking forward. 
Yeah. Well, I really uh, want to thank you so much for uh, sharing this story. And it's just really is an amazing story and an amazing illustration of, of what's going on, and what many people face. And thank you, Michael and, and Rachel. Thank you, guys. <laughs>